And we are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. It's an important job in Washington, D.C. that uh, very few people are doing, but my next guest is uh, outstanding at it, and that is uh, the job of observing who moves between our government and the private sector and what happens and how does that influence policy how does that shape our future jeff hauser is the executive director of the revolving door project and he and a colleague recently wrote a piece that i thought was very illustrative of some of the uh challenges we face trying to reform policy in this country and also just uh, offer some insight into how things work in Washington. Um, so first of all, Jeff Hauser, welcome to the Zero Hour. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to have you. And uh, secondly, uh, why don't you just take a second and tell our audience precisely what the Revolving Door Project does? Sure. Uh, I founded the Revolving Door Project to try to focus uh, first and foremost on the executive branch of the US government. Uh, I don't know that I wanna blame the old song about how does a bill become a law, but the focus in politics, be it uh, in the media and often among progressive organizations is on Capitol Hill. How does a bill become a law? And two things, one, oftentimes, Good bills don't become law. We all know the reasons why, including a Republican control the House, but sometimes even when Democrats control the House, we don't get good laws. But secondly, and I think actually more importantly, once a bill becomes law, what it actually means depends on how the executive branch executes the law. How do they manage the powers that a law gives them? Are they enforcing rules against bad behaving corporations? Are they implementing a law vigorously or are they being wimps in uh, enforcing laws? Uh, and that matters on everything from the Inflation Reduction Act to the Clean Air Act to the Sherman Act uh, on antitrust, a Fair Housing Act, Civil Rights Act, you name it. The executive branch really matters and it gets far too little scrutiny. Uh, it gets too little scrutiny that is from the left and from civil society, but corporate America is well aware of how many levers of power exist within the executive branch. And so they lobby it both directly and indirectly at great uh, volume and with great effectiveness. And in order to do so, they hire alumni of the executive branch to guide their efforts and to deploy their uh, network of connections to make the executive branch, to mold the executive branch to how corporate America wants it. So this has been going on for decades. And there really has not been any organized progressive pushback to make sure that the executive branch includes the people it needs to include, that those people have the powers and tools necessary to implement the good laws that do exist in our country and to uh, expose what corporate America has been getting away with for decades. And so that is the role where Bombing Door Project uh, aims to fill. And that's a great explanation, as uh, as so someone said, might have been Elizabeth Warren, personnel is policy, right? So, you know, who you pick determines what happens with the, uh, to a large extent with the laws that have been passed. Uh, and there's another piece of it, too, Jeff. This, this ties into the piece that you and your colleague Max Moran recently wrote, which is that these appointments, especially at the most senior level, to a certain extent, shape uh an understanding of how the world works right in other words the, the the top appointees in any administration uh have a platform uh both the public platform and through networks of you know influential columnists and journalists and so on their perception or their stated perception of how the world works kind of shapes the media and shapes the the public's understanding too so it's not just when they're in government but it's before and after in between uh they may say and proclaim things uh without us the people we the people understanding uh that they may have conflicts of interest and, and so on is that a fair statement yeah, absolutely. I mean, Revolving Door Project sees itself as sort of the uh, semi-insider arm of the populist movement that is critical of the notion that 
relatively too few elites wield far too much power in American society. And on the one hand, there are rarely organized conspiracies in the worst case scenario of like, because these elites are not competent enough or cohesive enough to carry on like a proper uh, conspiracy often. But what isn't a well-organized conspiracy can still be enormously detrimental. And there can the ebbs and flows of conventional wisdom among these elites is incredibly consequential. And without any sort of cohesion or conspiracy, they can still move mountains and change uh, not only what is thought of and done by people within their circle, but everyone outside of it. And so when you have a former secretary of the treasury like Larry Summers, who is also a university professor at Harvard and the former president of Harvard. So wielding like enormous credentials uh, about when you take a figure like Larry Summers and he embraces cryptocurrency, that has implications both within the executive branch of the U.S. government, but also within how economic policy and cryptocurrency are discussed. Uh, both within the elites and across the broader public. It just sends a message that validates the cryptocurrency graphs. So, uh, you know, what you're describing, I think Disraeli called it uh, a conspiracy of shared values, in a sense, where they don't get together in a back room and say, ah, we're going to tell them this. But they believe the same things. They espouse the same things. They profit by believing these things uh, personally. And uh, so... There doesn't need to be a conspiracy, right? Because the, the values, the perceptions are the same, and which gets us to Larry Summers. And, and, and I think it's important to, uh, to talk about him. And, you know, your piece on uh, Larry Summers and crypto is extremely illustrative. But, you know, Larry Summers has been for at least 30 years uh, since he worked in the Clinton administration, uh, leading go to quote unquote expert, you know, obviously prominent economist uh, at Harvard, former president of Harvard, uh, held all these high positions, uh, been a go to guy for the press, uh, for the media for a long time, and uh, has often and frequently been wrong about many things. But that, you know, in that world, it doesn't matter, right? Um, so because it's a self-reinforcing uh, set of shared values. And the reason why I bring this up is because, for example, you know, the knock on progressive economists used to be that they predicted eight out of the, out of the last four recessions. That was the joke, right? They're always predicting. But the knock on accurate knock on Larry Summers is that he predicted nine out of the last one inflationary cycles. And when it finally happened, it didn't happen for the reasons Larry Summers said, but he's been taking a victory lap. Everybody's been saying, yes, Larry C. Larry Summers was right. And I mean, he was wrong, spectacularly wrong over and over. Um, but now they're doing things that would, uh, you know, I, many of us would argue are detrimental to the working people's best interests because of what people like Larry Summers have been espousing on the basis of his usually incorrect prediction of inflation. So the reason why I bring this all up is that now we have this sort of encapsulated example of all this which you and max moran wrote about which is you know the the kind of horrible beauty of the crypto situation is that it's almost like a capsule pitch snapshot of how all of this works because it's happened fairly recently it hasn't happened over decades like other types of economic thinking and uh larry summers was very much a part of it so tell us a little bit about what you and max wrote sure um so we noticed that Larry Summers uh, has been the sole board advisor to an organization, a corporation called the Digital Currency Group. And the Digital Currency Group, it owns uh, hundreds of different entities. And among them are some of the most prominent cryptocurrency investment vehicles that exist, uh, including uh, Grayscale uh, and Genesis. Genesis is uh, in the process, it's gone bankrupt. It's a massive failure. 
So right off the bat, it seems relevant that Larry Summers has been advising a company whose flagship entity is in bankruptcy. That should, you know, have a little bit of shame attached to it, um, especially because it's within the cryptocurrency industry. It's not like, OK, you tried to solve a clean energy problem with batteries and the technology didn't quite work. OK, admirable effort. Like your goal here was to grift people in crypto and you failed. Like you succeeded for quite a while. There are many, many victims. And now they're going to like be greater victims because you can't account for all the money that they entrusted with you. But we started poking around and it turns out that Larry Summers is not just dabbling in crypto, that he has been associated with crypto for a very long time. He was a senior figure at the massive venture capital fund, Andreessen Horowitz, um, when they got into crypto. He was a board advisor to Zappo, a very bizarre jurisdiction hopping. So they get, it doesn't stay in one place long because it's not really big on law following. Uh, cold storage company, they literally build uh, storage units into mountains in Switzerland for people, paranoid people and or law evading people to hold like their Bitcoin and stuff. Hmm. Uh, they He's involved with Atlas Merchant Capital, which is interconnected with Circle, one of the largest crypto companies and one that's under uh, significant regulatory scrutiny at this moment. Uh, he is um, you know, associated with Block, which used to be Square and rechained and changed its name because they were so enthusiastic about blockchain and Bitcoin. Um, and he's also involved in all these like shady, uh, a few different um, fintech companies, including a couple that are quite shady. Uh, and so fintech is like, hey, let's uh, take consumer practices which are shady and put them on a phone and call them innovation. Uh, and the type, this is the type of thing when you talk about personnel as policy, the fact that we have Rohit Chopra at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, that is one of the signature wins of the progressive movement under Joe Biden, that we have a protege of Elizabeth Warren uh, kicking ass and taking names on behalf of consumers. Um, and so Larry Summers is a, an avid proponent of crypto firms. He is an avid proponent of uh, regulatory arbitrage via apps so that you can have shady financial practices on your phone. And he is being treated as a representative of the mainstream Democratic Party, such that when he criticizes Joe Biden uh, for the American Rescue Plan and for other fiscal policy initiatives, it is taken as a uh, really indicative statement because it's Democratic former Treasury Secretary attacking Democratic president. And that just has a lot more ballast with the media and, frankly, a lot of less ideological readers and watchers of television than if a criticism comes from a named Republican. It really matters to the Biden administration when they're being criticized by a former Democratic Treasury Secretary. And that is something that is understood by these industries when they hire people like Larry Summers, that they are borrowing his ostensible goodwill and good name within the Democratic Party. Yeah, Jeff, that is so important. And, and, and I think this is a good time to bring up, Jeff Hauser, that um, Larry Summers was part of the Clinton administration during the deregulation of Wall Street, which uh, we were told by Larry Summers and Robert Rubin and other members of that administration, as well as by Republicans like Phil Graham and so on in the Senate, that this was going to be a wonderful era of financial creativity and innovation. And we were unleashing the, you know, the energies of the market to help lift up the world. And of course, what we had instead was a global financial catastrophe uh where the the rescue efforts uh, afterwards were directed toward the banks primarily and the institutions involved larry summers did great robert rubin did great all these democrats did great bill clinton did great uh rest of the world not so much uh and so this is this gets back to you know a guy who has a record of being not just wrong but 
wrong with enormously destructive consequences and yet still listened to uh still carries heft and credibility and so uh you know the crypto story was one where they were very much in the process of trying to buy off the refs right once again and doing pretty well at it until everything hit the fan um and so look you know i don't know i suspect you don't know what larry summer's motivation is but you know he's profited well from and seemingly learned little from past experience about you know the magic quote unquote of uh, of deregulation and of quote unquote innovation and so is it fair to say we shouldn't listen to the guy um i mean i think that he definitely deserves uh to be dropped down from his current status as the single most influential voice of the economics profession. Uh, whether or not you want him to go down to zero or just one of hundreds is, you know, it's kind of a theoretical question at this point because he is so entrenched as a paid contributor to Bloomberg, to Wall Street Journal, as somebody who is very tight with the uh, Sulzberger family that runs the New York Times. Uh, and, you know, what I've been told by uh, journalists I trust at some of these institutions is that, like, the readership or the viewership really do value Larry Summers. Like, it's gotten to this one of these situations in which he is genuinely kind of too big to fail in the sense that his name is so big that there is no degree of being wrong, or it's a very high degree of being wrong that would ever diminish the value of his opinions. Um, and we must acknowledge that there are some factors here that are interesting to learn from as to why Summers is so ubiquitous. The single most important is that he wants to be and that right. he is like he can often be rude to reporters in that way that important people get away with being rude. But he still often will provide a pithy quote. Uh, he'll text back. He calls back. He takes phone calls uh, and he speaks with seeming confidence he'll contradict himself his if you actually like sketch out everything he said in 2021 about inflation and the ostensible victory lap he was on in 2022 it doesn't all track but if you are willing to project confidence and do so in a way that is media friendly like you give on the record quotes back to reporters working on deadline quickly that gets you far and like honestly speaking there are some very commendable progressive experts um, and you know less self-promoting centrists who are just not as good with the media. And so it, it just has to be said that there is something that Larry Summers is bringing to the table. It is not the genius that he would have you believe, um, but there are some attributes of Larry Summers that makes it less surprising that he is everywhere. Um, and the problem is that by virtue of having been everywhere for so long, and by virtue of being a Democrat willing to criticize Democrats, he is genuinely valued by a readership that can't be bothered on their own to track his predictions. But once it just becomes known, his predictions are going to be heard by a lot of people. They might move markets. you got to monitor them. And then as an editor or producer of a television show, you're like, this getting Larry Summers' voice is valuable. And then even if he's rude to a reporter at this point in time, once he becomes too big to fail... The, the reporter can't really ice him out because their editor or producer is like, we need this voice. So it's a really bad situation. And that's why we are going to continue. It's going to require a lot of repetition from Revolving Door Project and uh, others like-minded institutions to elevate reasons why Summers should be taken down. And sadly, I don't think having been wrong about derivatives in the 1990s and Brooks Lee Bourne having been correct and uh, Larry Summers and Robert Rubin being wrong, like relitigating that is important to understand, but it's not going to in and of itself knock him out of the New York Times. But our hope is that we can knock him down a rung by emphasizing how much he embraced cryptocurrency for how long and just like the sheer, are you kidding me nature of the crypto bubble uh, hopefully can cause some degree of blowback on Summers that actually dings his reputation. You know, there's a kind of 
uh, systems, you know, sociological systems theory thing going on here, right? Which is y- y- you have, and that's one of the many reasons why I find this topic fascinating and important, aside from the fact that your work in sort of demystifying the Larry Summers phenomenon so that it's less relied on, it's you know, it's important in and of itself, but but part of the other part of this that fascinates me is that he's such a good case study in something that happens, you know, uh, that really influences our politics and our media, which is if I'm a senior executive at a bank or a, a broadcasting company or a newspaper and I'm making a lot of money and, you know, I, I want to think I'm a good guy, uh, it's very reassuring. To hear somebody say, no, you really don't need your taxes raised, uh, either, you know, in general taxation or, you know, lifting the payroll tax cap or any, you know, you're good right where you are. What you're doing is fine. Uh, here's a Democrat, you know, one of the, you know, if you're a quote liberal media guy, one of the good guys telling you, you know, just you're fine. Stay where you are. Do what you're doing. That is going back to the conspiracy of shared values, right? That is reassuring. It's something I feel comfortable hearing. If I'm a reader of the New York Times and, you know, which has many affluent, you know, ostensibly liberal readers, uh, the kind of people who describe themselves as socially liberal, for example, uh, you know, that's nice to hear. And so, this is all and then you throw into it the fact that the prominence oh boy is that any better jeff yes is that better yes okay i'm gonna make a note for troy okay where did you lose me um i i heard like it was reassuring like to uh the elite person um, but I, 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 it was around like 45 seconds ago or now maybe a minute, minute 15 ago. Okay. Well, let me try to figure out where, uh, what I was saying. Did I talk about the New York times yet? Yeah. It's, it's reassuring to hear somebody like kind of say the status quo is working. Yeah. Okay. I paused the timer. Let me just think about where to pick up. So all these factors work together in making somebody like Larry Summers prominent. He's got a lot of constituencies who enjoy hearing from him, from, you know, people who want to purchase his influence to people who just feel reassured by hearing him. These are maybe a minority of the population, but they're influential. Um, And then that becomes self-reinforcing. So what you're trying to do is not just demystify Larry Summers and maybe take him down to one among hundreds, uh, which is legitimate. I mean, there should be different voices debating economic theory, but uh, you're also challenging that bubble that that he represents, which I think is really important. But if Larry Summers were just one of, you know, hundreds of prominent economic theorists giving their opinion, he probably wouldn't get gigs like the one he got in the crypto industry, right? I mean, that, they were purchasing the whole package. They were purchasing influence, weren't they? Yeah. Um, cryptocurrency firms, when they brought Larry Summers on as an advisor, would give public statements about how this is going to help their business. And they would say that in part, the prestige that Larry Summers brings would help normalize and advance cryptocurrencies march uh you know, in their view, uh, into the mainstream of international economic life. They made no bones about the fact that his name was what they were getting. Uh, It wasn't necessarily his insight as such. It was his credibility. Uh, This is something we often see in at the Revolving Door Project, that uh, entities which bring on a former SEC commissioner or bring on a former senior Justice Department official they don't hide the fact that this person is going to understand how government works and will bring them a certain credibility, that they are hiring a CV more than a person. I mean, oftentimes maybe they're, they're doing both, but they're definitely hiring the CV. Uh, and that's uh, problematic 
And we think it's important to realize that when Larry Summers is talking, he might be talking his own book. That is to say, Larry Summers believes that people behave rationally in economics, that their economic interests determine the decisions they make. Well, this guy has a really complicated nest of personal economic interests. So it is our view that under both Larry Summers' ideology and common sense, that when he is discussing any economic issue, he could be impacted by his uh, economic entanglements. And while we have like assembled a large swath of them, we don't necessarily know that we know all of them because Harvard University does not require him to make all of his uh, financial entanglements known. Uh, so we don't know every different entity that he is speaking on behalf of. We don't know if he makes the occasional phone call into former uh, colleagues, let's say, Gary Gensler at the SEC on behalf of crypto. Like, I mean, I think right. Gensler is doing a pretty good job, but uh, right. nonetheless, I'm sure Summers has a relationship. He uh, probably has a relationship with senior figures at Treasury, at the Federal Reserve, et cetera. Uh, we don't know who he's making phone calls on behalf of. Harvard is allowing him to be essentially a full-time pundit and or uh, like business person while ostensibly a university professor, it's ridiculous. I don't he is not doing he's not spending much time on Harvard University matters. Uh, he is not doing serious intellectual work. He is uh, a rent a quote and he is a rent a name at this point in time. Um, and so we think there's a revolving door concern. We think there's a university concern about academics. Uh, selling their name. Um, Tim Wu uh, is a Columbia law professor who um, spent a couple of very useful years in the Biden administration on the National Economic Council, helping to advance the anti-monopoly cause. Um, and he just did very, he just returned to Columbia Law School and he just wrote a Twitter thread uh, expressing amazement at the number of colleagues who were expert witnesses for corporate America. Uh, while ostensibly full-time academics. This is a real problem. Uh, I think more elite academics are seeing this among their colleagues, uh, and it's very similar to the revolving door problems within Washington as such. Uh, the same thing is infecting the academy, uh, and it has for a long time. I mean, Big Tobacco hired uh, academics to validate uh, tobaccos uh, and claim it wasn't uh, as unsafe as it obviously was. Um, and we're seeing this across a wide array of industries right now. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're trying to scrutinize how people become members of the elite. And do we assume that members of the elite are speaking as neutral experts who care about the public interest, or are they often just speaking on behalf of their personal economic interests? Jeff, this is so important. And, uh, you know, I I've said before that, you know, an economist is someone that thinks that every human being acts in their own economic interests, except other economists, right? You know, I mean, they, they have this uh, veneer, this pose of, uh, well, they're, uh, but in fact, people, it's impossible not to, is a real issue of corruption. I, 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 I call it corruption. It's a, certainly influence. I'm glad that you bring up the, you know, economic question of objectivity because, uh, I mean, I, associate of a very famous economist once told an anecdote that involved a half hour on the phone with some corporate executives and the economist then hanging up and turning to this person and saying, I just made $75,000. You know, I mean, this kind of, uh, it, it affects everything. It influences everything. So, you know, the without opening all wounds, the kerfuffle over a presidential candidate a few years ago, giving, you know, millions of dollars in speeches to Wall Street or whatever it may be, these things do affect, even if the candidate, even if the expert doesn't think they do, they have to, right? I mean, they, uh, you know, it's something the public deserves to know about. But I guess that gets us to with Larry Summers, Given that he's not in a public position right now, he's working for Harvard. He's in effect trading on the Harvard name, I would say, but he, he, you know, that's a Harvard question, not a government question per se. You know, is the ta is, is the way to address that, uh, you know, that you guys are using is that information, just making this information available to the extent that you can unearth it? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, so this is part of what um, we have uh, been launching since the summer that we call an economic media project. And so uh, it is kind of an analog to our primary focus on the executive branch. And it's about conflicts of interest within the economic media, uh, because there's this close connection between the conversations that exist within economic media and the decision making of the executive branch. And so Summers is the single most influential outside voice on the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve is the most powerful part of the executive branch, full stop. Um, it determines monetary policy. It's also the key financial regulator. And it also, interestingly enough, is in charge of payments uh, and like how money is conveyed, which is, of course, of tremendous interest to both the cryptocurrency and financial technology, i.e. fintech industries with which Summers is so associated. So Summers is a paradigmatic case for us, but we it's not like we have a legislative proposal out there that would weigh in on Larry Summers. We want to knock him down a peg in the influence that he has on the executive branch, both directly via like channels that may be hidden, but exist where I'm, he is on the phone with people up to and including at times Joe Biden, um, but we also really want to get him knocked down a peg or three in the economic media. Um, we want him to be treated as one voice among many and not this neutral oracle uh, revealing truth to us uh, lucky mere mortals. This is a guy who's talking his own book, advancing his own interests. Um, and it's, I mean, frankly, I mean, he has these economic interests. I also think there's an entire theory of Larry Summers that he just remains upset that he didn't get the Fed chair position in 2013. And he just sets himself up in opposition to whatever Elizabeth Warren, with whom he, you know, he blames uh, his defeat on Elizabeth Warren. And so, you know, he spends an enormous amount of time talking against student debt relief because it's an issue that is so closely associated with Elizabeth Warren. And so uh, cryptocurrency, Elizabeth Warren is the number one skeptic of cryptocurrency in Congress, along with Brad Sherman. Uh, but and, you know, there, there's definitely some just he's got some hater energy, I guess, is another way <laughs> yeah. of looking at it. But well, he's I, definitely in no ways a neutral oracle, even if, if if any of us are, it is not Larry Summers. Right. And he radiates he, hater energy, by the way. But he, and, and all this matters, I guess, in conclusion, because uh, this affects real uh, people in their day to day lives, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people, because when the Federal Reserve is influenced and strengthened and bolstered by the rhetoric of Larry Summers, which I think it is, to raise interest rates, for example, uh, on the idea that the labor market is too hot when wage increases are trailing price increases and uh, and so on and, and you know we could go and when there have been good studies josh pivens at epi and others on what the you know that uh, how he can use it to attack programs that help people you know kill the uh, child tax credit or whatever when it can be shown that that's a small percentage of the inflationary increase that affects millions of people or hurts millions of people so this is not just an abstract exercise in you know a vain and prominent uh, self-interested figure this is a vain and prominent and self-interested figure whose influence even outside of government i would argue is harming a great many people right fair oh absolutely i mean he has made outlandish statements even as the inflation rate has broadly speaking over the last six months declined in, li in, light, in line with the assessments from progressives that this was excessive profiteering combined with uh, the inv uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and other like pretty clearly one-off factors uh, that impacted supply outside of the labor market. Mm -hmm. He has been uh, arguing that we need uh, in unemployment to go up and be sustained at higher levels for five to or more years in order to ramp down inflation. And mind you, for several years, Larry Summers was giving speeches about secular stagnation, which argued that there was going to be a problem in the uh, American economy of uh, being unable to produce enough inflation that we risked a situation like Japan, where they have had deflation, which uh, can have all sorts of, you know, different but significant uh, deleterious impacts on an economy. Uh, so 
Summers advancing that has definitely um, given ballast to Jay Powell's instincts as a former private equity executive running the Federal Reserve to attack wages uh, unabashedly and having a Democratic former Secretary of the Treasury and somebody who you know was the runner up to be chairman of the Fed in 2013 advancing the, these anti-worker theories is extremely influential and very disturbing. Well, Jeff Hauser, uh, executive director of the Revolving Door Project, very, very interesting and important. Uh, thank you for that. Where can people go to find out more about what you guys do? Uh, sure. Uh, you can find us at the revolving door project dot org on uh internet and on the web wow i'm acting like it's 1996 or <laughs> right right on the world wide uh, web i think you meant to say yes right uh, yes uh, and uh at revolving door dc on twitter uh and we're also on mastodon and other friendlier places as well all right well thanks again and um larry summers you have an open invitation to come on my <laughs> humble program and, and explain yourself uh and we'll be right back after this i'm richard R.J. Epscal, and this is The Zero Hour.